Betsy, welcome to the second episode of my Beating Globally series of interviews with other beaters, other beat artists. Um, I'm so glad you're here. And uh, before we get into your work, we're going to focus on your studio jewelry, your bead knitting jewelry. Um, in this meeting, in our next meeting, we're going to focus on you as a teacher, as an educator. And we're going to talk about your book and about some of the mechanics of bead knitting. So first, I have to confess something. I don't know how to knit. I don't know how to bead knit. And I'm a total novice and I don't know anything. So you're starting with a blank slate. And other people who are watching this might also feel the same. And there are probably a number of expert bead knitters who might be watching this. So welcome. And I'm glad you're here. Well, thank you for the invitation. I was very excited to receive it. And I understand um, the terms of our relationship and that um, your confession, they say confession is good for the soul, correct? Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that uh, one of the things I learned fairly early on um, when my book came out, and we'll discuss this later, was that many knitters are also closet beaters. They have huge bead st stashes that they don't necessarily know or didn't necessarily know how to utilize until learning about bead knitting. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that we'll have people, hoping we'll have people who are parts of uh, both sides, people who are beaters, people who are knitters, and people who do both. Okay, great. So before we talk about your incredible work, um, I'd like to tell viewers a little bit about you. You grew up in the Philadelphia area, where you still live. And um, you have two children, uh, a daughter and a son, both of whom are grown now, and you're retired. Um, your studio jewelry is represented by Graver's Lane Gallery in Philadelphia, right? For many years, right? Yes, yes. Um, I'm very fortunate to have them representing me there in what's called the Chestnut Hill neighborhood of Northwest Philadelphia. And uh, the director of the gallery is someone named Bruce Hoffman, who has been extraordinarily supportive of me and my work. And um, I don't think I'd be where I am now without him. Okay, that's great. And you have a number of private collectors um, buying your work, collecting your work, among whom we can mention two very illustrious art jewelry collectors. Can you mention them? Because I won't get their names right. No, it's quite all right. Um, the person who has the most amount of my work and who was my first collector is a woman by the name of Marcia Doctor, who is an extraordinary collector of not just jewelry, but other art. Um, she's quite extraordinary and very generous um, and philanthropic. She is also on the board of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City and has been a great supporter of my work, uh, which was brought to her attention by Bruce Hoffman, as a matter of fact. So that's how she found me and how I found her. The other person is a woman by the name of Elsie Mishy, who is from New Orleans. Uh, she was a faculty member at LSU and she came upon my work randomly on the internet and Fantastic. saw a piece uh, on my website that she fell in love with and I ordinarily do not sell from my website but um, she was really clear that this was a piece that she wanted and she acquired and I subsequently learned that as she was acquiring my piece there was an exhibition of her contemporary jewelry collection at the LSU Museum of Art mm -hmm. which was quite extraordinary. Great. And we'll be including links, whatever links um, are appropriate uh, to these two uh, well-known jewelry collectors um, in the show notes, right? Thank you. Yes, that'd be great. A pleasure. Now, in terms of your education and your early career, um, you were a theater major at Cornell and you trained no, as an it's actress. It's so logical, right? To start it's really out logical because your pieces are actually very theatrical. So I see no, I see no problem with that. I see a lot of continuity, actually, you know, in the sense that they're very you know, spectacular and theatrical, right? They, they, Iconic. I, do tend to, I do tend to veer towards statement pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, that in that regard, it does make sense. Yeah. I was a theater undergraduate theater major, wanted to be an actress uh, at Cornell University. They had a professional acting program. And I always wanted to be an actress, but I don't think I ever truly understood what it meant to live the lifestyle of an actor. So when I went to New York after college to pursue that um, at the invitation of the American Mind Theater in New York, I met a lot of people who uh, had been chasing that dream for years and years and 
sacrificed a family life and any kind of stability, which was what I grew up with and what I really wanted for myself. So I made the difficult decision to leave that behind and uh, try something else. Um, and you you had it for a time, you had a, a career in healthcare and you even pursued an, an MBA and, and, and uh, yes. you were awarded an MBA in healthcare. Can you tell us a little bit about how that fits into the whole picture? Well, when I came back from New York, I continued to do theater as an avocation, but as anyone who does theater as an avocation knows, you still have to have a day job. Mm -hmm. And so my day job was in a doctor's office, which was an easy transition for me because my dad was a physician. Mm -hmm. And um, I got more involved in it than I had planned to when I first started out. And so it led me to a consulting career where the consultants I worked for wanted me to be credentialed, so supported me in getting my MBA while I was working full time. So it took me four years to do that, but I was able to finish my degree. And uh, it was it was an interesting and challenging career, and I don't regret having having done it. I met a lot of really wonderful people and I think contributed to um, their businesses. So, yeah. Okay. And then you eventually settled down, got married, had two children, and as kind of something to do on the side, you were a voiceover actress, right? Yep. My theater um, experience led me to uh, meet another mom at the Y who was doing a master's in educational media, needed a voiceover artist to do um, a project she was involved in and knowing my theater background and I guess we had enough conversations that she liked my voice. So she asked me to do that. And that led me to pursuing that for a while. And it was great because I could do that while I was raising the kids. It was a very flexible career. It was also nice to be involved in a career where they call you the talent. You walk into a recording studio and they go, the talent's here. But they also didn't care if I came in in my pajamas because <laughs> they're just interested in your voice. So it was great. And I ended up... Um, doing a lot of technical work. I was the voice of Philadelphia International Airport for a while. I did, um, I hooked up with a, um, a very interesting audiobook producer here in the Philadelphia area. And that for me was the most fun because he insisted that we, um, that all of his books had what they call fully voiced recordings, meaning that you had to have a different character voice for every character in the book. So much like I did as a child, I got to sing and dance and do all the parts. Well, that's fascinating. Absolutely. So all those times I passed through the Philadelphia airport on the way to one show or another, that was your voice I was hearing. Um, and I didn't it, know it. It may, well, it may have been. It, on At times it may have been. It was also more commonly on the radio. Uh -huh. uh, they had um, a radio station as you approach the airport that if you tune into it, it would tell you any issues about travel. It would warn you about um uh, you know, not leaving your luggage unattended, those kinds of things. So my husband liked to torture the people that took us to the airport by saying, you hear that voice? You know who that is? That's the woman sitting in the back seat. Okay, so that's where I heard you. Maybe not inside the airport, but on the bus, the airport bus, because Correct. I know I took it many times. Yeah, yes, that's where I would have been. So your mom taught you how to do knitting, but you didn't start bead knitting uh, until 2002. And now I'd like to start looking at, at your earliest piece, a sampler. This is a beautiful piece. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, it is. It's um it is a it's a sampler but not one that I create. Oh, I created. I knitted it, but it was the result of the first and really only bead knitting class I ever took. It was 6 hours of bead knitting at a um a knitters expo with a woman by the name of Lily Chin who I always like to credit. She's an extraordinary knitter, designer, um teacher and I had never done bead knitting and I took the class on a whim. And this was the result of six hours of class time, but it just opened my mind to possibilities. And I always say, I feel like having taken this class, my knitter's brain exploded. And all I wanted to do was play with beads and fiber. Mm -hmm. And so you went on to experiment with many more structures um, and you, you created what you call the UBO board, your, UB, your unidentified beaded object. Am I getting that right, board? That's correct, my UBOs. So when I came home from this class, um, I started 18 months of play. Mm -hmm. I went on eBay. I ordered just boxes and boxes of random beads because I didn't own any. I had lots of yarn and lots of knitting reference books. So I took the 
techniques I understood as a knitter and tried to add beads to all of those techniques to see what would result without any plan for what I was going to do with what resulted from that play, that experimentation. And it was so liberating to kind of not have a specific plan of what I wanted to do, but I could just take these techniques and add beads, but I would always do it in these little small pieces, what we in the knitting world call swatches. Mm -hmm. um, and I would save each of them to see what had happened. And because they weren't, they didn't, there wasn't a plan for using them. That's why I called them unidentified beaded objects. But I continue to do that to this day when I'm planning a new piece, I call it R and D, my research and development. <laughs> I'll um, do a small swatch and sometimes it turns out immediately that it's something I want to pursue, but other times I have to tweak it. And I usually do that one small change at a time. I call them what ifs. What if I change the bead? What if I change the fiber? What if I roll it up? What if I turn it inside out? What if I turn it upside down? And each iteration brings me one step closer, usually, to the piece that I want to create in full. And if it doesn't, it's still a valuable exercise because I've learned what doesn't work, mm -hmm. which as often as not is as important as learning what does. So you might be able to see over my back shoulder there, mm -hmm. that's part of my UB, my current UBR, UBO wow. board with things that I've been working on. Okay, so you have more than one UBO board. I used to have an, two entire doors in my old house before I moved. I put cork board on the back of two doors in the room and they were both totally filled. So um, I did a little curating and picked the ones that I thought had the most potential to have on my current board and the other ones are in a big tub somewhere. Okay. But I can still look at them. Um, I find it amazing that only 10 years later, you published uh, your book, um, Betsy Beads, Confessions of a Left Brain Knitter. Am I getting that right? That's correct, um, except I didn't publish it. It's not a self-published book. Um, it was done by the folks at Xbox Books, uh, who were extraordinary publishers of craft books, and they sponsored the knitting expos and marketplaces where I took my class um, that taught me how to do what I do. And uh, yeah, it was... Um, we'll, we'll get into that more in the second interview about how that came to be. But just know that the techniques that we, some of which we'll allude to in our interview today, will go into more detail as we explore the book. But it was, it was two and a half years of my life from the time I signed my contract to the time the book actually was published. But it has been the most extraordinary, affirming, uh, positive professional experience, I think, of my life. I'm so proud of this book. I really am. And I'm grateful to the people that helped me put it out into the world. And it's very beautifully published. I mean, the, the, the level of detail and the level of, a level of care um, and respect is visible on every single page. Now, is this available on Amazon right now? It is still available on Amazon. Uh, there are some sellers who still have new copies. There are lots of used copies out there, as there are with many of these books. Um, as well as I think there might be, there were digital, um, there was some digital available availability uh, in PDF form. I don't know if that's still out there, but yes, the book is still generally available. Okay. And so now we turn to your, your studio jewelry, or some would call it your art jewelry. Um, this is one of your earliest pieces here. Can you tell us about this? So uh, one of the first knitted forms that I played around with is something called I-cord. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it would be a really good way to segue into jewelry once I started playing with it. I had started to think about a plan for what to do with all of these UBOs and these methods that I'd come up with. And I first thought about doing some kind of two-dimensional art, but then I didn't feel like I had anything to say. And so why do that? So then I thought, well, maybe I'll do home decor and I'll do heavily beaded pillows that might have a market. But I did a couple of them and I was totally bored by it. And then when I started doing working with i -cord and realizing how it resembled jewelry, it kind of opened a window for me and had me start to look at jewelry and think about ways that I could replicate the forms of jewelry, but in knitting. And so i -cord was the first thing that I thought of because it was like a, a, a necklace in and of itself, just being a piece of cording. Mm -hmm. So I took these... Um, 
pieces of cording and I attached them to a beautiful closure that I was able to find and put the closure front and center as a focal piece. Mm -hmm. And then um, having met you uh, much earlier on before the book, around the time that this uh, piece was designed, I started to learn about off-loom bead weaving, which was um, a an art form that I knew nothing about beforehand, but I was fascinated by. And so bought your book among others and um, self-taught myself the simplest bead weaving techniques. In this case, it's peyote. And then used the peyote to heighten the, the texture and the architectural nature of this piece to make it a little something more than just cords. Well, it's a fantastic piece and it shows the, you're, you're knitting next to the beading. So they're not, they're, they're integrated visually, but they're not integrated structurally just yet, right? Perfect observation, absolutely. It's, just, it's a spectacular piece. Um, and next we're gonna talk about your uh, KISS, Keep It Simple necklace. This was a revolutionary discovery that you made that as far as you know, uh, no one else in the whole world came up with this concept until you did. Can you tell us about this necklace and the technique? Absolutely. So I call this necklace my eureka moment in knitting. Uh, I loved I-cord, as I said, but I also love movement. And I always wanted to find a way to make the I-cord spiral so that it had that kind of circular movement. And you could do that by twisting the cord and attaching it, and then it would appear to spiral. But as soon as you undid the closure, of course, it would untwist. So that was not satisfying. That's not the look I was going for. And then one day um, I was working on projects for the book and starting with i -Cord, because that's where I started my own work and figured it was a good jumping off point for the book. And it occurred to me that when knitters make i -Cord, we always use a knit stitch. There are two basic stitches in knitting. I won't get too much into the weeds, but there's a knit and a purl. And they basically comprise all of the amazing work that's done in knitting. It's just these two little stitches, a knit and a purl. And it occurred to me that I cord was always done with a knit stitch. And I wondered why it hadn't ever been done with a purl stitch. And I thought, well, let's try that, which is something my mother always said to me when I asked her if she liked or thought that the ideas I had for altering a pattern would work. She would always say, I don't know, try it, see what happens, which at the time probably annoyed me. But many years later, I realized what a gift it was to be encouraged to try things to see what happened. So I did, I started purling I-cord instead of knitting it. And about 20 rounds up into the I-cord, I noticed that the cord itself had started to turn. Mm -hmm. And the more I worked, the more it turned and created this spiral I-cord. I, I was just, I was gobsmacked. And without getting too much into the technique, the technique creates one enlarged stitch that highlights the spiral, which in turn gave me the perfect place to incorporate a bead structurally, not adding it on afterwards. So that's how that happens. So that's the keep it simple spiral necklace. That was a real eureka moment for me. Okay. And pearl, you mentioned a knit stitch and a pearl stitch. For people like me, who are woefully ignorant of knitting, pearl <laughs> is not spelled P-E-A-R-L as I thought initially, but no. how is it spelled? P-U-R-L. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And next we have your beautiful morning glory necklace. I love this piece too. Thank you. So this is kind of the next iteration of making use of this spiral technique. And this piece has both uh, beads that have been knitted in structurally, but also contains beads that have been sewn on. So there's, there's so many ways you can add beads to knitted fabric. Um, and this piece shows several of them, but also incorporates um, work from your world. Uh, there's some offloom bead weaving to create the flowers at the end of this vine. Um, this morning glory was a result of morning glories that I had outside one of my first apartments that climbed up strings. And I just always thought they were so lovely and cheerful. And uh, they seemed the appropriate um, inspiration for a piece. And this was the result. It's just beautiful. Now, I have to ask you, because I'm a, I'm a beater, um, how did you create the, the tassel finials, those uh, those spherical elements at the end that, where you incorporate the teardrops? I'm going to have to ask you, what technique is that? Oh, okay. Come so on. I know, confession again, confession again. 
I do, I do pattern all of the pieces that I make because I don't trust my brain to remember all the techniques that I use. And so I did go back and I looked at the pattern that I had written up for this. And um, I actually read it to you. And I think probably neither one of us <laughs> could recreate it based on what I wrote. And in truth, I think that one of the things that I love about learning about off-loom bead weaving was the notion of holding the beads in your hand, you know, and being able to take a needle and just put them together and start moving the thread around and try it and see what happens. And I think this is another example of that, try it and see what happens. And if you look at a flower and you can see the petals and these, these lovely beads are top drilled. So there was a wonderful place for the thread to go through. And then if you created a circle with them, there was your, there were the petals. And then the, the conical part, I think is again, also just stringing these little tiny beads together, continuing to do um, smaller and smaller concentric circles that sat on top of each other. And the next thing I knew, I had this three-dimensional morning glory flower. So I, I apologize to those people who would like to have a specific pattern, but I don't have one. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's just It just shows that you've invented a whole, you basically invented a new beading technique. Um, it, it kind of from a distance, it looks like it could be a, a type of herringbone, but it isn't. It's something you invented yourself yet to be named or published, but <laughs> just very lush, very beautiful. And it really adds, it's the perfect completion to the beautiful lariat, right? Um, yes, the lariat. And, but that is, uh, there, there is one technique your, your folks will recognize, and that is the part that extends the knitted vine into the bead woven flower is um, spiral rope. So that is something that thank you. Can... Thank you. I feel better that we can <laughs> name a technique, a beading technique. Okay. Yay. But we don't always have to do that. After all, this is be about bead knitting. All right. Okay. Your slider bracelets. And there's a glorious picture of you wearing them right there. So um, this picture was taken for my book um, as my author's photo. And I just thought it would be fun to throw on a number of these slider braces that I had made just to add some color because I, as you can see, I tend to dress in black and use that as a palette for my work. Mm -hmm. um, but the slider bracelets represent my attempt to, once I had created, um, I had knitted this I cord, I wanted to create a way or a bead placement pattern that allowed a cord looking structure to be heavily beaded. And so I, and all of these, believe it or not, even though they look like they might be bead crochet, um, they're actually knitted, but they're actually knitted flat. So it's a piece of, I mean, knitting is essentially, uh, creates a two dimensional flat fabric output. It's how you manipulate that fabric or that beaded fabric that creates the three dimensional forms that um, underpin my jewelry. So these slider bracelets were um, knitted in stock, what we call stockinette, knit a row, pearl a row for the knitters out there. And all the beads are on the pearl side of that flat fabric. And as knitters, we know that stockinette fabric wants to curl. So it did this itself. It rolled into these wonderful little forms by themselves. And then I just had to figure out a way in which to graft the bottom edge to the top edge so that it would appear seamless, so that you would not see that it was flat to begin with. And that involved my, again, experimenting to create a graft that would allow these um, pieces to come together the way they did. But because the bead placement is staggered, if you, can, if you have the opportunity to blow it up, you'll see that the beads are staggered, much like the teeth of a zipper, so that when the edges come together, they do mesh like this, which is why I call the graft that holds them together a zipper graft, because that's the way it works. Okay. And you've sealed them with what looks like a peyote stitch uh, tube? It is. It is. I Believe me, I cannot tell you how many times that um, off-loom bead weaving comes to the rescue <laughs> for finishing pieces that I have, or just... Um, I don't know, it just makes them more interesting, adds texture to um, the pieces. And so in this case, it was more practical than anything else because the ends of this now rope that I had created were unbeaded 
and they were stitched together and I needed some way to cover them. So creating this payout tube seemed like the logical answer. And each one of these slider bracelets is a one of a kind, an experiment in color um, and, and bead placement, right? Correct. Um, I like to, um, most of my work I would characterize as one of a kind, but every now and then I'll come up with something I'll call a limited edition design. And that is what this is in that the construction and the placement of the beads in the fabric is the same every time, mm -hmm. but the color choices and the patterning is different for each and every one of them. So in that regard, they are each one of a kind. I never I never repeat anything. My mm -hmm. one of a kind piece is certainly not, but even in my limited edition pieces, they always differ by color um, and bead placement. Your color aesthetic is really subtle and I love it. I mean, it's, um, it's sort of under, understates itself, but it's still very rich and beautiful and lush. Thank you. Well, well, we'll see as we move forward. Oftentimes, my color choices are dictated by the fiber that I use. Mm -hmm. A lot of time, the um, indie dyers whose yarns I'm very drawn to have done a lot of the legwork for me by putting their colors together. And then I get to jump off from their colors and, um, and claim them as my own <laughs> in my work. Um, as, as long as there's this photo of you wearing the sliders, you're wearing, what are you wearing right now? Could I ask? Yes. So this is, this is a, a, a not for sale piece. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. It's, um, it's a combination of here. There are FEMO beads okay. that were part of a bracelet that my husband gifted me mm -hmm. and, and it was just on elastic and eventually it wore out, but I loved them. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to just restring them as a bracelet. So I decided to use them as a basis for a necklace. And then um, most of the fibers, which is kind of, let me see if, you can, if I can, if I can get it off and hold it up, I'll show you. Um, you. There are, um, there That's you go. That's beautiful. Um, the, the ones in the middle strand are all cashmere. Um, okay. Very, very, very fine cashmere um, okay. by an independent dyer whose yarn I use a lot. Okay. And then the top ones um, are all the same from the same, um, uh, skein of yarn okay. um but anyway that's it's fantastic it's a three strand oh. necklace then yes with one of your if you like the the closure is oh i love that oh it's fantastic you can, so you, you can, can wear you, the closure in front or I, in back i do i do okay i, I do both but i'm not going to try to put it back on now just lay it to the side and here. you mentioned that those closures you got them many years ago from a store, I forget where, a store in the U.S., but they had originally been made in China, right? And that they, they stopped being made. Um, I don't know that they totally stopped being made, but the quality has declined to the point where I wasn't comfortable using them. They used to be all set in sterling mm -hmm. and they had um, fully uh, closed backs. So mm -hmm. there was quite a bit of silver in them. And then I guess as silver became more expensive, the backs became open and then they started doing silver plate. And right. Uh, right. so I... Yeah. So they're box them. clasps, we would call them, okay. um, be with beautifully bezeled stones um, in right. malachite and in turquoise and in other materials. All kinds of, uh, lots of agates. They the, the Chinese do tons of agate closures um, and they do mother of pearl, uh, jade. Um, there's lots, there's, there are beautiful sources, but they've also gotten exceedingly expensive as, okay. as you know. Okay. Now the precious hoop earrings, are they made in the same technique as the slider bracelets? Exactly the same. It's just with teeny tiny little bitty um, metallic beads and a metallic thread that can stand up to the edges of these little hexagonal beads. So all I did was took um, an existing um, hoop earring form and wrapped the little beaded, flat little beaded piece around the hoop and then just stitched it together. In this case, I didn't even have to do the graft because it's so tiny, you'd never notice. And it's just stitched together along the inside of the hoop. But that technique can be used to make any hoop earrings you have that you find yourselves not wearing anymore. You can make them new again by, by covering them with, with bead knitting. What a great idea. It's fun, it's fun. And the bracelet, is that the same technique? Um, th that has some of the same techniques on the top and the bottom are are is a roll mm -hmm. similar to the slider bracelets. It's just not 
grafted doesn't need to be it's and it just curls itself i actually have actually here's the piece and i don't know if we'll be able to see this but if you can see how it's flat knitting the knitted stitches are on this side mm -hmm. the pearl the beads and it and it wants i mean i don't have to ask it i don't have to stitch it down even it wants to roll like that okay. and the the center one uh were two more rolls that i did stitch together with beads applied on the outside and again the color choices came from this wonderful mother mm -hmm. of pearl cameo mm -hmm. that i found from the same supplier back in the day absolutely ingenious and extremely beautiful thank you like all your work how about the maroon necklace um this is a wonderful example of trying to find a way to now just not do cording like the eye cord of a necklace but now i wanted to move forward and create more of the three-dimensional forms of traditional jewelry. And one of those would clearly be beads. We all wear beads of some shape, size, uh, variety. And at first I thought, well, how am I going to do that? Again, knitting is two-dimensional and I wanted a three-dimensional form. And then I realized that as knitters, we are often creating knitting for a three-dimensional form, that being the human body. And so all we're doing with a sweater is we're making a form to cover this three-dimensional shape. So if I wanted to make a bead, I just had to have a bead that I could make a little sweater for, <laughs> just make a, a, a wrapper for, if you will. So this is kind of an advanced um, iteration of that. Some of the first ones I like to, I often show when I'm teaching, I show students my first attempts at things mm -hmm. because especially as women, I think we're really hard on ourselves. And if we don't get things right or perfect the first time, we say, oh, I can't do this, or I'm, I'm not good at this. I'll never be able to do it. And I want people to know that pieces like this don't spring full blown from my head. There's lots of, and ideas like this, there's lots of samples and trying and working and things that don't work before you get to the things that do. So um, this is an example of, um, beads knit uh, with wrappers. So there's a wooden bead, the kind you could get at Michael's or AC Moore that's drilled, has holes. And then I've, the first thing I have to do is create just plain knitting to see how big a piece of knitting I need to cover that form. And once I know that, that gives me what I call my palette, how many stitches and how many rows I have onto which or in which I can put beads. And then I can go ahead and design with graph paper, um, where the bead placement is going to be to see. And then I'll know how many beads I need to string and in what order I need to string them in order to get the patterns. This is a very simple one. There's really only two colors of bead and the second color is just that little equator. So it's not as hard as some of the other patterns I'll do, which actually you're gonna see in the next one. But all the beads are strung in advance and then knitted into the fabric and then grafted around a wooden bead. That's spectacular. And I think I called it maroon, but actually the na its name is marooned. Yeah. Right. I tend to get a little cutesy with names sometimes. I like it. I like it. I like it. And the next piece, the bottle glass piece. Right. So this is um, similar in intent in that I have um, wooden beads that I've covered. But in this case, I've done more patterning. Um, again, I've started with plain knitting, given the size of the bead. And you always have to test because if you're using a different weight fiber mm -hmm. or a different size needle, the palette can change. So um, if you're using anything different, you have to go ahead and do your swatching and your gauge checking beforehand. Lots of knitters, that's like anathema. Nobody wants to gauge, no one wants to swatch. But if you don't do it, you're not going to get the outcome you want. So in this case, I took my color inspiration from these wonderful pieces of bottle glass that I was able to acquire. And just that gray on the inside and then the pale, pale turquoise on the outside, was, I just thought was so beautiful. And fortunately, because um, I have beads of <laughs> probably pretty much every color you can imagine, I was able to pull beads from my stash that I could use to make these, to make these patterns. And um, I love how it shows the variety of bead placement that you can um, create if you just take the time to do it. 
And how many patterns of placement, bead, bead placement are here? Is it three or four? Um, there, there are one, two, there are four. The, um, the focal bead is a one-off. Then the two on either side are um, the same. Um, but interestingly, when I graphed these, they were straight lines, just diagonal straight lines. But when I put them on the wooden bead, because of the way they're cinched to be closed at the end, it caused them to twist a little bit mm -hmm. and turn them into a spiral, which I was, uh, was another surprise that I love. And then the other two are two different. The other things knitters may notice is that the fabric side that's showing on the top two, you're looking at knitted stitches, the focal bead, you are looking at knitted stitches, but the stitches on the two spirals that you can see are purl stitches. So mm -hmm. in, one, in one case, the knitting side is the public side, we mm -hmm. don't say right and wrong because then it gets confusing with right and left. Then the knitted side is the public side. And in one case, the pearls are the public side of the right. knitted. Okay. Well, I, it's a spectacular piece Thank among you. many. Um, and, and tell us about Gone Viral. So Gone Viral has um, more of a symbolic meaning than, than most of the pieces that I create. And I actually, I brought it up with me because I did want to wear it. So after we talk about it, I'll probably put it on. So I can wear it for the rest of our interview. Um, this piece was created as a result of the pandemic. Um, my husband likes to joke that I was one of the few people whose life didn't change during the pandemic because I spent <laughs> the same amount of time up in my studio doing work. I'm a bit of a natural recluse and I just enjoy my time doing this. Um, but this piece came more towards the end after vaccinations were available to people. And it seemed like we had started to get the situation under control. And I did not want to lose sight of what we had all gone through. So um, if you remember when uh, newspapers or uh, magazines or the news would show representations of the coronavirus, it was always a red ball with little spikes that came out of it. So you can see that um, <clears throat> on the right side of that piece, there's a small red coronavirus um, piece, but the rest of the pieces are to represent um, having made it through and that life goes on and that um, at people of different shapes and sizes, you know, we all got through. And, um, and I wanted to, I wanted to remember that and um, somehow put it into a, a piece of work that I could keep and, and, and look at and, be grateful. Beautiful. And it's in your private collection, right? It is. This is, this piece is not going anywhere else. Oh, good. Put it on. Great. Yeah. Yeah. If I can. Closure is a little tricky. We, we can move on as I try to get this off. I love the soft neutral colors, you know, combined with the one red, which really punctuates everything. So well, it does. It does. It does. There so the next go. piece is mirror, mirror. Another piece I love. Yes, That's not happening. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Um, mirror, mirror. Mirror, mirror um, is the result of some beads I bought from you when you had your D stash sale. I remember. Uh, yeah. And uh, I had never seen beads like this. Um, I think you, I mean, you know more about what these beads are called than I ever will. I think you called them nail heads. Um, nail heads are flat backs they're vintage um yeah. so they're probably about 100 years old and they're I think they're mirrored I, I don't they're remember mirrored. if they're, they're all, glass or plastic they're, on top in a kind of a shade of what I remember as an aqua or a silver no no they're silver they're silver okay. there's, no color, there's silver. no color to them and the backs are metallic the backs, the backs are, are metal. Metal. probably foiled right foiled mm -hmm. backs? they just they look like dark like a dark base metal of some kind to me. Okay. You okay. Know, I, I can't remember. They have, four, I, they have four points of entry into them. Right, right, right. And I think you said at the time that they were originally designed to be used on gowns. I think so. Gowns. That's my best guess. Yeah. They're vintage. But, but I you just saw them, them so subtly here so beautifully. Well, I wanted to give them a little space um, so that you could see them, but I don't know, have a little pop of color. And then I also had these, um, the beads, the, the larger beads in between my knitted beads um, are also reflective there. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought they were a great combination. And um, and I loved doing, I was so grateful to have the um, uh, graduated 
uh, mirrored beads to use as the closure because it also makes it comfortable. I really try to take into consideration wearability with all of my pieces. Um, people often look at my work and think it's going to be heavy because mm -hmm. there's a lot of components, but I like to say my work has substance, but not weight because the fiber weighs nothing. And most of the beads weigh nothing and the little wooden balls weigh nothing. Okay. So compared to a piece that was, you know, all um, metals, I, I just think they're, they're, they're very light in weight and, and easy to wear. And the fiber feels good against your skin. It feels mm. warm. Mm. Fantastic. Um, and the next please, uh, I always, I can never remember to, whether I should call it donuts or do nots. <laughs> um, you could call it either, but it's, it's, I think of it as dough knots, as in donuts, the, the okay. we eat the donuts. Um, and the reason being that, and I, I brought two things to show really quickly, not to get again into the weeds too quickly with technique, but there are two basic ways to cover a bead, two directional ways to cover a bead. Most of the ones we've looked at so far, as I said, we're a flat wrapper that is grafted around a bead. So imagine the styrofoam is a bead with a hole through it. And this okay. is the direction the wrapper goes around and okay. then it's grafted together okay. on that okay. side. But the other way that you can cover a bead is vertically so that the holes are here, okay, here, and the stitches go this way as opposed to this way. Okay. okay. So, so this piece represents, um, uh, I started out to make covers for beads in all of these colorways. Um, but then when I put them to the side, I actually just put them on a knitting needle and they got all squished together. Mm -hmm. And I liked the way it looked. And I thought, well, why don't I use them that way instead of putting a hard bead underneath them? Um, and th they were too flat. So I decided to stuff them. And I realized I could create a soft substructure for these knitted forms by using batting. So I just took the kind of batting you would use in a quilt or for the sewers would use and just stuffed a little bit of batting inside that shape that give, gave them a little bit of puff. And so that then I could work them together um, in this piece. And um, yeah, so, and they look like donuts when you smash them down, mm -hmm. they have a little hole in the center and they look like donuts. So um, so the, that's how the donut came, but then they turned into doughnuts because the ends of the knitting I had left hanging. We often as knitters leave all of our finishing to the end because no one likes the finishing of hiding the threads that are left over. So they were all left and they were hanging and I liked the way it looked. I thought, well, that actually increases the interest of the piece. So while I didn't use those the ends because they were all different lengths, I did finish and hide them inside the bead. I then took the silk threads that each of these were made out of and I tied them in knots in between each of the forms and then tied little knots on all the ends of them so they wouldn't fray. So that's how it became dough knots. It's a wonderful touch, the tassels. I don't it wouldn't be the same necklace without the tassels. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Or do you so call them fringe? Um I don't know what I call them. I don't think I've ever named them. Okay. They're just well, we'll they're lovely. Silk. <laughs> they're lovely. Absolutely lovely. Thank you. Um, and next is gears. So this uses the same form as the donuts. Um, but instead of stuffing the donuts, I really do let them get super flat. Mm -hmm. And as with the uh, donuts form, there's a bead around the circumference. And the same thing with these. Um, but instead of stuffing them, I decided to wrap them with fiber. And it was a technique I started to explore at this point in time using fibers because I wanted to show how the fiber looks in different uses because it shows up differently if you knit it versus if you were gonna crochet it, if you were to sew with it. And when you wrap it, it shows itself in different ways. Mm -hmm. So um, I was able to wrap each of these little donuts and then I laid them out on my work table in a form like this. And I said, well, now how do I connect them? And then I realized that the beads that were on the circumference were in the right orientation to be used as the basis for peyote. Mm -hmm. So I was able to use peyote stitch um, to connect these via off loom bead weaving with these wonderful etched Japanese beads. And um, here's was the result. And the neckband is? Um, peyote. 
It's peyote. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. And Myra. I love Myra. Me too. <laughs> are you allowed to, are you allowed to love one piece more than another? I don't know. Well, um, if you, if, if you're their mother, you, you probably shouldn't, but if you're not their mother, it's, it's fair. Right. It's fair. So, um, this piece came about, um, as a result of my friendship with another knitting designer named Myra Woods, who I viewed as being totally organic in the way she works. She didn't have to plan things out. She wasn't sitting at home making graphs and counting beads and whatnot. She's a knitter and a crocheter, and she worked with all different mediums, but her work was always so organic that I just really appreciated it. And I wondered if I could work in that way, and I wanted to give it a try. So I am... Um, Instead of planning out how these beads were going to take shape, I, excuse me. Bless um, you. Thank you. Uh, I just started working and decided I'm just going to change colors when I feel like changing colors. I'm going to try to um, channel Myra in, in the making of this. And it, it resulted um, in this piece, but indirectly that I used her methodology because I originally thought I was gonna take all of these randomly produced beads and I was just gonna string them all and wrap them around my neck and they'd be really interesting and organic and they wouldn't have to be symmetrical or whatever. And it didn't work and they just didn't hang right. I just wasn't pleased with them. So I put them all down on my work tray. And once again, I know it's hard to believe, I had exactly the number of large knitted beads that you see here that I was able to symmetrically composed to make this necklace by adding uh, the, the brown glass pearls and the little pieces of the little jasper beads at the bottom to create that shape. I didn't have anything to make the neck cord. So at that point I took little teeny tiny wooden um, beads and made little covers with them teeny tiny. And then the closure is a um, Bakelite um, clasp set in um, sterling. And I just loved that pop of color at the top. That's, mm -hmm. it looked like the sun and these were kind of like the rays of the sun coming out from it. And I had to name it for the woman who inspired me to work in this way. Yeah, the clasp, it makes it just a, a beautiful focal point. Um, and also adds some historical depth too, if it's mm -hmm. Bakelite, right? It is Bakelite, yep. So in this piece, you know, you, you've often said you you prefer, just by your nature, you prefer symmetry. Oh, um, and that it can be an effort for you to achieve asymmetry. But in this piece, there's a beautiful balance between asymmetry and symmetry. I mean, it couldn't be any more perfect. And harmony, there's a lot of harmony here. They're not battling for attention. They're working together to make a spectacular one of a kind, a masterpiece, I would say. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of this piece. And it's, um, it's one that I still own, actually, and I, I wear um, happily. I do. And the copper colored beads are, did you say those are glass strucks? We would call them um, brown I, glass beads? The, no, I think they're called glass pearls. Okay. Okay. All right. In what, in what millimeter size? I'm just curious, like six or eight or? Oh, no, no. They're bigger than that. Okay. Oh, no, they're bigger than that. Tens yeah. or twelves? Maybe twelves. Yeah. yeah, probably at least. Yeah. I would say twelves. I'd have to, I, I could measure them, but I think, yeah, they're, they're bigger okay. than Okay, and next comes another piece I, I love, um, Hexaquan. Tell us about this piece. So um, the inspiration for this piece was the um, well-known world champion figure skater, Michelle Kwan, who I loved. I love figure skating and I love watching her skate. And she always wore, um, I think, which I think is a kind of classic uh, Chinese adornment of a red thread with a piece of jade hanging from it. I just loved, um, red is my power color. You can see my chair behind me. I just love my red tray. I just love red. And um, so I just, I loved the juxtaposition of that strong red next to the green. And so I started looking for subtle shades of green in my stash of silk threads and came up with this combination. Um, and this bead represents a different way of placing beads on fiber. These, the little teeny red beads that you see on these mm -hmm. are placed with a crochet hook. So each teeny tiny bead is placed with a little bitty crochet hook on a single stitch as I work up. And this is the vertical orientation, the vertical construction of the, of the knitting. And um, there are six stripes of beads on each, uh, of little beads on each of these knitted beads. Mm -hmm. And I loved seeing them, but when I held them on their end, I could look down and I saw the way the six 
stripes came together and I wanted to find a way to show that in juxtaposition to the top pieces. So the ones you see hanging from the bottom are similarly constructed, but they're strung through so that you can see the end. So the ones on the top, um, to be perfectly honest, I can't remember whether they're stuffed or whether there's a form underneath, but in any case, the hole goes vertically through them. Mm -hmm. And I want, I needed to be able to string through the side of the bead in order to show the tops. So I knew those had to be stuffed because that enables me to string through the um, side of the bead so that you get to see both the side view and the top view. And then I had to do the red to delineate the top from the bottom. And I also was fortunate in that I found these, the hook and eye closure, they're vintage and they're silk wrapped um, hooks and eyes that I think are pretty cool. Another perfect touch that really br brings the piece to a, a very unified close, you know, it, it's, it's a very unified, like all your pieces, structurally <laughs> integrated, beautifully integrated piece. Thank you. Well, the name again is, because um, a hexagon is a six-sided figure and Michelle Kwan was the inspiration. So hence, hexagon. Oh, it's, I think it's brilliant. Well done. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. And the next one, loopy. Um, loopy. Loopy was another experiment. Um, I had these wonderful um, hand-painted uh, fibers. This time they're made out of tensile. Uh, this is another indie dyer that I discovered who I have lots of fiber from and whose fibers I use all the time. Um, Tencel, they make very fine fibers, most commonly for hand weaving as opposed to knitting. Most people don't knit with fiber this tiny, but because they're hand painted, they don't repeat their color patterns, which is what makes them more interesting for me, for my eye. And I don't have to worry about them pooling or puddling. Um, so I started making cording again with these. And then I had found these beads, which I thought were African wedding beads, but you tell me that uh, they may have another name. So I'd never heard the term before until I looked it up on Google, but they're called Mali, Mali wedding beads as after the country, M-A-L-I, Mali, right? Okay. But um, back when Robert Liu of Ornament Magazine published his book called Collectible Beads, they're in there. Um, and I looked it up recently, and he just says that they're from Czechoslovakia, or, or it would have been maybe a Bohemia back then, that they're antique uh, or or vintage, and that they were mm -hmm. traded to Africa and then traded back here, starting in, in back to the United States, starting in the 1970s. And they have this very distinctive shape that looks, you know, to a lot of people like a light bulb. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they're called light bulb beads. They're just amazing. <laughs> I have never seen them used as creatively as you've used them here. You know, very often you see them strung um, and they, they they kind of smush together, um, you know, and they don't fit well together. They, be, they become kind of a mass, an undifferentiated mass when they're strung together, which actually there are people like me who like that kind of mass. <laughs> but you've used them in such an elegant way here. Well, I just, I, when I saw, when I saw them, I had to have them and I just thought they were so unique. I mean, from a distance, they appear to be solid colored, but if you look at them closely, they have a lot of underlying detail that I find very rich and um, happy. They just feel happy to me. And um, so uh, I was able to um, place them at the bottom of these loops that I had created. And then again, as I was exploring this wrapping technique to use something as fine as this thread to wrap was an experiment that I ended up being happy with. And then how did they end up being woven together like this? Again, a happy accident that as I made them, I put them on a knitting needle and saw how they sat. And then I realized that I could change the way the needle went through them to create this. And once I knew I could do that, then I just had to just had to create um, uh, a neck strap that I could weave through them that then would complete the piece around the back. So again, um, and that is their tiny little peyote stitched, little peyote stitched strap. You say happy accident, um, but it's, it's, if it's a happy accident, it's born of, you know, years and years of experimentation and commitment and showing up on a daily basis, you know, to play with the beads and knitting, you know, so well, that's my, my pleasure. 
accident yeah. in the context of something much greater and in the in the context of a master, yeah. I would say. That's true. And Anthurium. So this is a um, quite a, a different, um, uh, a, a, it's just a different take for me. And it came from my fascination with this particular plant. And I can't remember where I saw it for the first time, but I just thought it was really unique and weird and fun. And um, as you alluded to earlier, I, I describe myself as pathologically symmetrical. I, I really have a hard time breaking out of that. And so when I see an opportunity to do something that's a little unusual, I want to try. I really want to try to, to be not so symmetrical, although this piece necessarily doesn't necessarily <laughs> belie that fact. But the, the instinct was there to, to replicate, to see if I could replicate the leaf of this very interesting plant in knitting. Um, and I also had these um, freshwater stick pearls dyed, these golds, and I wanted to use them. And they seemed to be a perfect tongue for this um, for this piece. So um, it was a little challenging to, to get the shape of the beads to correspond with the shape of the knitting. So that, that took a lot of trying and failing um, until I was finally able to achieve something that I was comfortable with. So, and then the, the petals, if you will, they wanted to close up on themselves mm -hmm. and hide the tongue. And um, so I discovered that I could use a fabric stiffener. Um, if I uh, soaked the piece in the stiffener and then just laid them out flat, once it dried, it kept them in their shape. So that was a nice thing to learn about. And then again, they're attached to um, spiral rope. Fabulous. So tell me about Meander too. So Meander was one of the first pieces that resulted from my looking at um, fabric manipulation. I have a friend who's a seamstress and a knitter, mostly machine knitting, but very talented. And she introduced me to the concept of fabric manipulation. So she, shall I show the book? Yeah, please. Um, so she introduced me to that concept through this book, which we'll link in the show notes, right? Yeah. So this is the art of manipulating fabric. And as I keep saying, knitting creates fabric. That's what it does. And so I thought, well, I hear I have this fabric and I'm looking for ways to use it. So maybe I should look at muslin, which is what they used when they start talking about different ways to manipulate fabric, whether it's pleating or ruching or smocking. There are all these things you can do with fabric. And I thought, well, maybe I can translate that. I mean, I'm always looking for new inspirations, things that allow me to use my knitted fabric in a different way. As I would say to my students and to people when they first started looking at the book, if they seemed slightly intimidated, I kept saying to them, no, it's the knitting you know, it's still just knits and pearls. It's what you do with the resulting fabric that makes it different. And I like to call it knitting made clever. That's what it feels like to me. It's like, oh, I can do this, or oh, I can do that. So this piece was the result of that. So I took this one long, I made this one long strap because that whole piece is one piece of long piece of knitting with beads on the edges. Now I had to, again, um, engineer where the colors fell mm -hmm. so that I could get them the way they look in the finished piece. And also because the, the meanders differ in depth. So that took a bit of math and engineering to figure out, but that's really all it is. is and then it's just stitched together and, um, that shape after it's been hooked back and forth, kind of like the switchback of a, of a road coming down a mountain mm -hmm. and um, stitched together. And then there was this place at the bottom that just screamed to have something in it. And I found these howlite beads and thought they were the perfect addition to it. And then again, some spiral rope to create the neck piece so that this piece sits right here. And this is this is the piece that um, Elsie Mishy, the, um, collector that we talked about previously um, fell in love with. And she yeah, it, was, <laughs> it was exhibited, um, wasn't it in her show at uh... No, the show the show had already gone up um, oh, okay. when, she, when she bought the piece. but um, she was very sweet and told me that it was one of the things that got her through COVID. She said she kept it at home and that even when she couldn't go out, if they were she and her husband were sitting down for dinner, that she would uh, she'd wear it. she'd wear it around the house. 
And since then, she's told me that she wears it quite a bit. So that gives me great pleasure to know that she not just owns it, but that she also wears it. Yeah, very fulfilling. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sure it'll be in a future show of, of her Hope collection. So. Hope so. And Arroyo. So this came as a result of some time I spent in the Southwest and also out in California and saw what are called arroyos, which are these gulches, if you will, that um, accommodate the, um, the melting of winter snow and water comes rushing down through them in the spring. And in the winter, they're dry. Um, and I just felt like it would it was a great idea to try to replicate that. Um, so that's what this piece tries to do. It um, has gullies that the water is going through. And then um, it also gave me an opportunity to experiment with a little more uh, fabric manipulation. So the bottom row, as you can see, is they're actually pleated. So uh, this piece has, this has a lot of directional knitting going on. There's uh, horizontal and vertical that come together in different ways. It's a fairly complicated technique to create this one. Um, and then again, in addition, all the beads have to be mapped out to begin with so that they all come in the same. So they come where they're supposed to come. And then it also has a beaded edging along the bottom. And then the last little bit of um, attention that needed to be paid was, the, again, the little peyote tubes that um, surround the, the neck strap, which I really, I love them. I just think they it kind of ties everything together. You've really captured the feeling or the, the feeling of what I imagine is a Southwest landscape and the mm -hmm. colors, you know, the mm -hmm. soft uh, turquoise colors and the shades of russet and brown. Uh, just so, so well done, Betsy. Thank you. But, you know, this is this is what I mentioned before. This fiber was hand painted by an indie dyer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm gifted. I'm gifted with these materials to work yeah. with and they often set me off on a particular path because I'm so inspired by what the people who create the materials have come up with. It makes, it makes my life as a creator so much richer. Yeah. Now, do you share with them, the creators of the, the, the yarns or the fibers? Do you share oh, with them? Oh, absolutely. Oh, aren't no, no, they no. just so grateful and impressed? Well, they're, you know, it's it's fun for them to see how their materials are being used because yeah. they get used by different people in different ways. This particular dyer, as I said, they are no longer, these ladies have retired. Um, I hopefully have enough of their fiber to last me as long as I'm knitting because um, I, when I knew they were going out of business, they sent me a whole box full of stuff and let me pick what I wanted. Um, but it's it's rewarding for them to see their work used in different ways. And so I'm just one of many people that have used their work to create. I mean, when they would oh, when they would sell in a marketplace, they always had examples of the things people created with their, and things that they created, they were weavers. So they made their own work from the fibers that they, that they dyed and um, inspirational. Fabulous piece. Uh, how about Fringeworthy? That is a silly name, isn't it? But it kind of had to be. Um, again, inspired by materials. This was a bead mix that um, a seller had put together. And I just love the combination of colors. And um, I wanted, I didn't want the beads to be, to take second place in this piece. I wanted them, I wanted a lot of them. I, I, mean, I wanted to show the combination that, you know, so inspired me. The hardest part of this, because they all had to be strung as individual fringes um, on um, probably, I think I did them on like wildfire or, you know, some kind of beading thread, um, but to make them random, to make them look random, because it's so hard to, to string them so that they come out looking like someone just went like that, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, say, well, I've got a yellow one, so now I've got to do a black one, or I've got a green one, so now I have to do a red one. So try to try to be a little mindless, you know, so that they truly are random, that it isn't the result of my being so OCD that I have to have this one follow this one and that one follow the other one. So so that's all done. And then, um, and it started with that. So that was done along the edge. And then the rest of it was um, actually one of my earlier attempts of what I call my abacus bead knitting technique, which we'll go into in a little bit. Um, but 
yeah, so again, I was able to use a little off loom bead weaving at the top to create the little toggle and the um, the uh, closure. So the toggle is peyote, right? Correct. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know how to do a lot of things, but I do know how to do peyote, or at um, least some you're, peyote. You're doing very, very well with within con within the the constraints that you have. You, you may have a few technical constraints, but you have no constraints of imagination. Or well, we, accomplishment. Yeah. I mean, you are well, able to bring your ideas to fruition every single time. I, 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 there are times I think, why am I not taking classes? You know, why am I not out there taking bead weaving classes um, to expand my repertoire? And I may at some point, I hope to, you know, I mean, you may, but you also may not need that because of course the bead knitting is what's central right, to, right, to your right, work, right? right? Yeah. To your I aesthetic too. I love learning new things. I yeah. love learning. So Betsy, tell me about rails. This is another outlier, I would say, mm. but because of the material that inspired it. So it's, I think it's pretty clear what that would be. And those are these, um, they're silver plated tube, curvilinear tube beads that I came across. And again, they say movement to me, you know, they're not straight, they're not angular. There's just this lovely curve that I wanted to find a way to showcase. And I tried a couple of different ways that were not successful and it can be frustrating. And sometimes um, I know you feel the same way. You just have to put things aside and say, I'm not there yet, you know, and let it percolate. And often as not, some idea comes to you when you stop thinking about it. You stop focusing on it so hard, you know, that the ideas start to arise and you go, oh, wait a minute, I could try this. And so that's a really useful technique for creatives is to not feel like you have to hammer at it until you get it right. let it go you know kind of siddhartha you know things come to you mm -hmm. when you stop looking for them mm -hmm. um so that's what this was and um, i found a way to use the um, abacus bead knitting technique and i hate to keep teasing that because we're going to talk about it a little more in terms of technically how to do it for you knitters out there but we will talk about this in the in the next interview i use that to create this piece so that it actually is knitted I mean, a lot of people look at several of my pieces and say well where's the knitting i don't see the knitting mm -hmm. but there are knitted stitches everywhere in this that connect these lovely um, beads and that this was this was the result yeah I did not see the knitting the, the, the knitting stitches dropped away and all I saw were, were how you use these beads now you say you're a materials driven knitter right sometimes um, sometimes that's one of the inspirations but yeah okay. this is one of them. Um, and I think you mentioned that you you were inspired by these uh, silver plate tubes mm -hmm. but I would never guess in a million years that you started you know, being inspired by the tubes, I would think you had a concept, a full, a fully, you know, fleshed out concept of exactly what you wanted to do here, because it's so cohesive. It's so perfectly rendered. So I can't see any, I certainly don't see any trace of experimentation here. I only see the finished piece and it's glorious. Thank you. But it's just, you've, you've actually kind of set me up to talk just briefly about my process, because I think it's, um, uh, something that took me a long time to discover. What you described is the way I think that people who are right brain dominant, who are those people that the world um, would recognize as being artistic, mm -hmm. um, are the people who are right brain dominant. I am absolutely left brain dominant. My sister refers to me as concrete, linear, sequential. And <laughs> It's, wow. it's, it's, it's not untrue. I mean, it really is the way I work. And for a long time, I felt less than because of that. I didn't feel like I could be artistic because I, my brain worked in a different way. And now I, with the help of other people observing my work and my own um, uh, evolution, I now embrace who I am and how I work. So I like to say that I envision, and this is my own interpretation, I envision right brainers um, working in such a way as that the heavens open, the sun streaks down with an idea, and then they're able to translate that idea into their work so that it's not materials driven. It's not maybe visually driven. There's an idea and they're able to realize it. I work exactly opposite. I like to say that my work doesn't come from ideas. 
my ideas come from work so that I'm always observing what it is that I'm making, what's on my needles, things I've made in the past, um, the work of others. I'm not shy at all about um, referencing the work of others. I believe everybody's work is referential. I think we all take inspiration from the work of others so that um, that's the way it comes to me. And that's a process that works for me. It's, it's partially engineering. There's a lot of math involved. Um, and that comes from my left brain, things that I'm comfortable with. So I've come to believe that left brain people aren't any less creative than right brain people. We just employ a different process. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, I'm not sure the distinction is so you know hard and fast between ideas driven artists and materials driven artists, because I see you as an artist, clearly. Um, we, we, there are many, many points of confluence, you know, between these two ways of working. And an individual a single artist could work in both ways pretty easily. I think no matter what we do, it's 99% perspiration. And 1% 1 inspiration. I forgot who said that, but it's a great way of putting it, you know. So we're yeah. all endeavoring to bring forth the piece that wants to come out, but we it doesn't tell us except in increments, incrementally, right? Yeah. And I I I've been stopped by people when I say that I'm, you know, so left brain dominant and people have said to me, well, but, you know, there's definitely some right brain in there that maybe your left brain process has now unlocked. And I think there's some truth in that. And I think we're all combinations. We just maybe have a little more to one side than the other, but I think no one is purely one right. or the other. Yeah, I agree. Well said. Okay. Uh, a Greek key, another piece I love. Um, so this was the first really clear um, major piece that I created using this abacus bead knitting technique. And without going into too much detail, what it allows me to do is to extend a knitted stitch. So each knitted stitch is quite small in height, and um, it's very easy to apply a, a single bead with a crochet hook onto that stitch so that the, the bead sits vertically but I wanted to find a way to add more than one bead so that I could make a larger um, palette, you know, a larger um, canvas of beads, if you will. So um, a lot of experimentation, tried a couple different ways to make it happen. I thought I had it worked out and then it didn't work out. And then I came across, I discovered a way to elongate a knitted stitch so that it allowed me to stack any number of beads that I wanted on it before proceeding to the next stitch. So all of the beads that you see create the, creating the Greek key here um, with a single row of knitting so that each stitch of the knitted row was elongated and then had beads dropped down onto it with a crochet hook. And then the rest of the knitting took place using a smaller version of that. But um, uh, it was, I, I didn't have to create this pattern um, I have a wonderful book of knitting motifs mm -hmm. that um, I think your bead folks might benefit from, even though it's a knitting book, maybe not yeah. something they would think to, you know, pick up right away, okay. but um, it has it's all kinds a thousand, of a thousand what? motifs, great knitting motifs. Okay. So they're all graphed out. And wow. so they could be used for any number of things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just, it, uh, so I found the Greek key in that book and then was able to use that as the graph for creation of this piece. Okay. So we'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah, I do think you're right. I think beaters could use those for uh, other techniques. Absolutely. Uh, anything else about uh, Greek key? The, the, I In this piece, I focused right away on the beads. I didn't see the stitches. And these are Japanese, uh, did you say square beads? They're square beads. They're Miyuki squares Miyuki that come squares. in... Um, three different sizes that I'm aware of. The little teeny tiniest ones are 1.8 millimeters. Wow. And then there are three millimeter and four millimeter ones. Okay. I and believe. where did you get them? Did you order them online? Um, I'm trying to remember. No, I think I got these at a, at a show. Um, there was a bead purveyor at a show. Um, but uh, I have several sources of online where I can order them, but I also have a fabulous, fabulous, anybody in the Philadelphia area, if I can give a shout out to this store, because it's extraordinary. It's called Blue Santa Beads. It's out in Media, Pennsylvania. And um, the owner, 
uh, Sarah Caldwell has been another one of those people who has supported me from, from day one and has more interesting components, not just she carries all the check beads, the glass beads, the gemstones, everything you could possibly want, all the findings, all interesting mm -hmm. stuff, but she's just really a great supporter of, um, of workers, you know. Okay, and how do we spell Lou Santa? Like in Santa Claus, Lou Santa, S-A-N-T-A. L-U? L-U? No, Santa Blue. Yeah, B L U E. Oh, Blue. I thought yeah, it was Blue Santa. Okay, Blue yeah. Santa. That's yeah, a great blue name. Blue Santa Beads. Yeah. Okay. It's blue in Santa Media. Beads in Media, Pennsylvania. We'll put a link in the show notes. Thank you. I would appreciate that. She's she's terrific. Okay. Uh, I mean, we Cotton all know how hard it is to keep these local stores yeah. in business. You know, so. we've lost quite a few bead stores here in the Chicago area. I think they've closed down all over the country because, of course, there were so many at one point in time, um, and I guess not, you know, then people began buying beads online, which is harder because you cannot see the right color. You, you never understand what a color is when you, when you see it online versus when you hold it in your hand. The other issue for us as bead knitters, um, and I always encourage my knitters to shop locally, is that not only is the color not the same online, for us, even beads that you have will look different when they have fibers strung through them. If the bead has any translucency at all, the color of the yarn will change the way the bead looks. So I always tell my knitters, if you're going to buy yarn to use with beads, bring the beads to the store mm -hmm. and ask the owner if you could string, bring a needle with you and string the fiber through the beads so you are mm -hmm. sure that you're gonna get the look you want with the combination of fiber and beads that you're choosing. Okay, that's excellent advice. We have that issue to some extent, you know, those of us who work with colored thread, you know, and mm, beaters, but not to the same degree at all, because of course, you, you know, you may be using larger beads than we're using. And, and if, if, if you can really see the fiber through, it makes an enormous difference, as you said. Yeah, well, one of the things I experimented with early, um, it was using clear beads, and so that I could see the fiber through the beads and mm -hmm. see what effect that would make. And I'll, we can show, show a piece of that in the next interview, but yeah. Okay, sounds good. And a copper mine. So this is another um, uh, piece that uses um, the abacus bead netting technique, but as opposed to being all the same height of stacks, like in Greek key, which all have 14 beads on each thread, um, this is three rows of bead knitting with some I cord in between, but the stacks change height, which is what allows the piece to have the flow that it does to create the movement um, by changing the height of the beads in each of the sections. And this is one of those other ones I could probably call this copper mine slash Myra because mm -hmm. I did not, I didn't plan this out in advance in terms of how I was going to stack the beads. I just started doing it. And then when I did the second row, got a sense of how they might nestle together and just let it evolve. And um, I was very pleased with the way it turned out. Yeah, as you should be. Um, it's a very sumptuous piece, a very rich piece. And I, I can envision a copper mine. I mean, you, you've captured this color so beautifully and in such a natural way too. Um, it's like the veins. I'm imagining yes, veins, exactly. you know, copper veins or something. I don't know if that's literally correct or not but it kind of yeah, no, I think matter. it is I think it is and I think that's what that's I don't think I the the piece came before the name when mm -hmm. I after I finished it I thought oh yeah that's mm -hmm. what it looks like and I would never would have guessed that it's the same technique that this the copper mine also uses the abacus uh, knitting tech bead knitting technique just like Greek key mm -hmm. It can be used in so many variations. It's one of the things I love about it. If I ever had the energy to do another book, it would be on abacus technique because the, the possibilities are really quite extensive. Yeah, and you'd be the person to do it. <laughs> Maybe you will. I hope you will. I yeah, never know. And I love these bracelets are spectacular. Tell us a little bit about them. So um, the one on the top right, the Moroccan cuff, Again, inspired by the beads that I found. There's a wonderful store here, and it's a huge store here in the Philadelphia area called Material Culture. And they have lots of ethnic um, beads and furniture and rugs and just, just gorgeous. A lot of vintage stuff, a lot of statuary for the gardens. And the little beads um, 
on the edges, which you alluded to, um, I actually went back and looked at them and um, they were sold to me as Ethiopian. That's as as Ethiopian? Ethiopian. And they mm -hmm. may well have been, yeah, these little copper, copper. ring yeah, beads. Little they're, yes, they're, they're, exactly. Look like they're hand formed, right? They and do. They all a little bit different. Age, they're either vintage or antique, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, I, I love them. And and then the the etched two beads I found um, actually online from the seller that I buy a lot. I used to buy a lot of my beads from they since have transitioned to just selling crystals. So I can't go to them anymore, but I have tons of components of things that I found and they just seemed, and again, this is abacus um, and each of the stitches is elongated and you can see it can accommodate a long tube bead or it can accommodate many of these little circular copper beads. And um, if you could enlarge it, I know it's hard to see the knitting, but they're knitted stitches at the very bottom through the center and then at the top, because that's how those little circle beads are um, knitted in the cast on and, and then added in the bind off of the knitting. And what are the two beads made of? Um, they're, I don't know, quite okay. honestly, I don't, I don't know. They're, they're etched, they're copper colored. Are, they say they're copper, but they're too, they're too hard to be copper. Mm -hmm. I think if they were copper, they'd be softer. Um, so I honestly don't know, but I don't know, maybe I should care, but I'm not sure that I do. No, I, I, you're, you're, you're an artist. Know. You're you're an artist. You're allowed. It's okay. It's artistic <laughs> license. You. you don't have to be Thank an historian, you. a bead historian. There are bead well, historians. That's why we have you. <laughs> well, no, I'm not a bead. I'm a beadwork historian. Big okay. difference. But I have oh. friends who are bead historians, and we could ask them. Okay, cool. Oh, and I and I I always end up with extras of all these things. If anyone wanted to see them, I'd be happy to share. Okay. All right. Um, how about abacus ombre? These are the square beads again. And um, again, it's kind of hard to see the knitting, but it's knit. Um, whereas the uh, Moroccan cuff was knit from the long side up. This is from the, um, it's the, the narrow side is where it starts. Um, and so again, it's abacus bead knitting. And if you look between the kind of square sections, um, you'll see a couple of little knit stitches, knits and pearls um, that connect that provide a little bit of um, separation between the, the beaded segments. And then um, I think this is when I first discovered that they made these closures that you could glue things into, um, oh. that they're used oftentimes for leather work, I think, because right. um, okay. there's an opening in them. And so it seemed like a, a nice idea and allowed me to glue the ends of the, the beadwork into the magnetic closure, which is what keeps it together. Yeah, and I, I love how the knit or pearl stitches kind of drop fade into the background right they're so discreet and they function really as kind of like spacer beads would function you know in beadwork um yet they're just so understated and you really give uh, the beads the full attention here yeah no i do and as i said sometimes people look at my work and they say well where's the knitting and i have to convince them that every piece mm -hmm. is based in knitting mm -hmm. But as you say, sometimes it's more appropriate and the design calls for the, the beads to be the star players as opposed yeah. to the knit stitches. And that's that's what's fun, you know? I mean, yeah. I have so many options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you use them so well. And, and next comes fruit salad, another fabulous piece. Shall we talk about the name first to get that out of the way? Yes, <laughs> let's talk about the name. <laughs> because one would not necessarily look at this and think fruit salad. Okay. Um, um, my understanding is um, in the military, when there are people of high rank who have lots of um, medals and recognition awards that they wear mm -hmm. on their uniforms, that those are called fruit salad. Oh. So, um, so these pieces to me felt like the kind of um, medals or the, um, I don't know what you call them, but the recognitions that you see on a, on a military jacket. So mm -hmm. um, each of the pieces coming down is a separate piece of abacus bead knitting. And then they have been stitched together, which you can um, get a little closer sense of in the close-up. You can see the knitted stitches that start and end each of the length, 
lengthy pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and then the tops of them have been folded around a piece of I cord, which is the plain knitted cording that we started with way back when. Okay. And then to decorate the I cord, I've tried to replicate um, some of the pattern from the uh, pieces that are hanging in little peyote tubes that surround the I cord to finish the neck piece. And then it's a, a vint, I love the closure. It's this big um, vintage um, piece that I don't even remember. I don't remember where I find half of these things, but I just always keep my eyes open. You know, you just never know. And the other thing for people who like for creatives, thrift stores, you know, when you find old jewelry that every thrift store has a box of broken, you know, pieces. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the closures or the components are wonderful. You know, and you can get them for a song and then take them and integrate them into your own work. And they're such a wonderful resource to just try to use those. You know, it there. never occurred to me that you could find amazing parts at a thrift store, but now I'm going to go and, and look. Oh, you betcha. Okay. <laughs> Oftentimes when people give up stuff, they don't realize even sometimes that the closures can be solid gold or they can be sterling and um, or the pieces, components of them can be. Um and not things you can find elsewhere. Okay, that's a great tip. Now, um, fruit salad, um, these chunky gold beads in the neckband, those are peyote? Beaded uh, beads. Beaded beads? Um, they're they're they're, they're little peyote tubes that are, okay. that are wrapped around oh, the I, um, I and, cord. And what beads are those in? These are again are the squares. These are the Miyuki oh, squares. Okay. Okay. Um, and okay. and uh these are the these are kind of precious. These Miyuki makes a 24 karat gold plated bead yeah. and that's what these are okay okay thus the the beautiful luminescence yeah. oh, fantastic okay slinky slinky well then we don't have a problem with the name with this one this is no. No, no, we don't. why it's named slinky this is again using abacus bead technique but in a simpler form um i discovered that by bead knitting um a single row of stitches and then putting abacus stacks on top of it would ordinarily create much like we see in the Greek key. But if I separate those stacks at the top, it causes them to splay and then creates a rounded shape that if you do it long enough, tends to spiral back on itself. Mm -hmm. So this piece is the result of that discovery. So you can see there's knitting at the bottom and then there's some abacus bead knitting, just a couple of beads, like two or three beads are stacked. And then what I've done is taken a needle. And so now the, the stitches, the knitted stitches are still on my knitting needle, but I've taken a knitting, a, a regular sewing needle and bring thread through those stitches. And in between, I put more beads that is what caused the stacks to splay and that creates the spiral. So then I took two pieces that I'd created like that and I stitched them together so that we have the the yin and the yang of the gold and the green um, spiraling together um, to create this piece. And I just love the movement of it. This is one I, I sold with some regret. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I might I might have to try to recreate something like this for myself at some point. Yeah, no, sign of a great piece that you, you it, it hurts to let it go. You want to let it go because that's where our pieces belong out in the world, but it also hurts to let it go. Yeah, it's maybe you hurt. have to make another one for yourself. I have to, I might have to. Now, is there any relationship between Slinky and Kiss? Are these two completely different kinds of spirals? Yeah, two completely different. This this one's they're they're created with very different techniques. One is purely fiber. I don't need any beads to create kiss. Mm -hmm. um, this I do need beads to create. Okay, uh, so you also invented this technique. Maybe. We could call it. Right? You know, we, whenever you techniques. say that, I get shy. You know, and I think mm -hmm. well. Maybe there's someone over in Europe who's done this and just hasn't published yeah. it or put it out there. So maybe I'm not the only one who's ever done it. Possibly, possibly. But, but I look at these, you know, from the point of view of the history of beadwork and how many contributions you've made to it. Like you would have to have your whole department in the history of beadwork, <laughs> the Betsy department. No, I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Wow. And, you know, it isn't really that new, that, that, that uh, frequent 
that an artist comes up with radically new structures um, in, in, or, or a radically new approach or an aesthetic in the history of beadwork, in my experience. Okay, there's a lot of repetition. A lot mm -hmm. of us are, you know, out there trying to learn new things. And the nature, part of the nature of learning is we duplicate what's gone before. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see this duplication. Granted, I have not researched this exhaustively, but I do not notice any duplication. Um, in your work, in your large body of work, you know, so many of these things are novel um, in the history of beadwork and probably in the history of knitting too, which I can't speak to, but I can speak to the history of beading. Enough lecture. Okay. okay. Conscious. Tell us about, tell us about the name of this piece and uh, then tell us about the piece. <laughs> so um, the inspiration for this came from a trip that not that I made, but that my daughter made. Um, to the Southwest, and she sent me back a gift um, uh, about the fine fine Indian jewelry of the Southwest, mm -hmm. which was this book, okay. and with a little note that said she hoped it would inspire me, because um, she knows how visual I am, mm -hmm. and so it did, and one of the things that I um, gravitated to were these um, concha belts mm -hmm. that were very common, um, American, uh, Indians, um, Native Americans uh, in terms of their artwork. And uh, I wanted yet again to see if I could replicate that form in what I do. And this is one of those cases where, yes, it is based in knitting, but it is clearly beat forward. And um, so these shapes replicate are inspired by these concha belts and the concha form um, that is part of these belts. And they're they're often oval and they have turquoise and then they're silver and turquoise or just plain silver. And um, so that's what I tried to do in this. And um, it, you can see little bits of knitting in the center, which is how it starts. And then it's abacus bead knitting for the stacks of those um, little rondelle beads. And then they are splayed similarly to the slinky. You can see how they cause it to go round, but instead of continuing in a long way to do it, I've brought them back together to create the circle because it lent itself to do that. And so I made several pieces, big and small, and then I just stitched them onto this peyote strap for the neck piece. So creative, so original. Could you hold up the cover of that book again? Because we, mm -hmm. on the cover, there are a number of concha belts, yeah. right? Belt buckles. Uh, concha pieces. Yeah, like concha pieces. right in the center, that's a concha. Okay, the and the that's the one that has... belt buckles. Um, okay. This is a maybe a form of a concha. It's, it's an unusual one in that it's okay. rectangular. But there's a whole section in this. This is a, a book from uh, the Millicent Rogers Museum Collection. Okay. Um, that my daughter sent me so yeah okay we'll put a link quite, in the show it's notes. quite the collector of, of um uh, native american jewelry okay uh and tubes tubes one um in my constant search of things that i can cover um <laughs> i was looking for something that i could um have exactly the length that I wanted because I had this thing in mind of making a triangular shape. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of cutting a wooden dowel was not in my skill set. Okay. <laughs> I don't play well with saws. Um, and then I discovered the um, tubing, the plastic tubing that florists use to hold up flowers like Gerber daisies. And it's quite soft, but it's firm enough that it holds its shape for my purposes but it can be cut into any length that I want. So I used that as the uh, substructure, if you will, for creating these components. And each of them um, has a knitted sleeve that is wrapped around them that allows me to use a beaded cast on and a beaded bind off to place the beads at the end of them. Um, but I wasn't real crazy about the way the knitted stitches looked in this particular fiber. But when I wrapped the fiber around the tube, I loved the way it um, it, it, it doesn't repeat, you know, that it's varied. Mm -hmm. I love the look of that. So that's why all of them then are wrapped. So the longer ones are in the triangular big focal thing at the bottom. And then there are mm -hmm. shorter ones to um, make the neck piece. And then they're all held together by um, round glass beads, clear glass beads um, that have been strung and just happened to be the right size that they 
fit slightly into the tubing, but didn't get sucked all the way in. So they stay where they are. So it was just, it was good fortune, serendipity that they, that they work that way. And then that tiny little piece of, again, my favorite peyote to, to finish off the piece at the top. The, so, so beautifully done. Um, I love the autumnal tonalities of the fiber, the, the mm -hmm. wrapped fiber, how subtle yeah. they are. Uh, yeah. contrasted with the the sort of you know, luminous uh, clear beads. Those are clear glass beads, right? You yes. said yeah. it it's hard so to well tell to... from the photo. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Um, it, it's just so unexpected to me. Uh, and yet it, it works. So they work so well together. So beautifully done. Bravo. Thank you. All right. Uh, after midnight bracelet. Um, this is um, a wonderful example of kind of just using different things that you have on hand. So the closure on this 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 was actually quite an early piece that i made um and it's uh based it's an extension of the same i chord that we talked about but that when you extend it so that it's not just um a round tube it goes flat and um the piece that of yarn that would come around the back knitters will understand this um is a perfect place to put these long a beautiful kind of titanium looking uh, bugle beads. So I combined the long bugles with then shorter beads for each of the the, uh, the the stacked parts. But you can see the knitted stitches through the opening towards mm -hmm. the back. And then the, all the little beads, the, the edging beads are all stitched on. They're all sewn on afterwards. They're not knitted in. Okay. And these are glass bugle beads. And I think you mentioned at one point that they're two inches long. Is that correct? Oh, at least, yeah. If not yeah. more. If not more. Yep. Okay. And I, I think it's fantastic how you've brought in the, the, the shorter bugle beads too, or whatever they should be called for the contrast. I didn't see it at first at all until mm -hmm. I started really looking at the piece and I was like, oh, another brilliant touch. <laughs> well, it's the variety is fun. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it breaks up the, you know, the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, all of a sudden. Yeah. It's... Yeah. <laughs> No, not there's no monotony in your work no well, absolutely well, not. And the other thing is how these buttons how the, mm -hmm. the little pieces inside mm -hmm. the buttons um echo the beads that yeah. go around the top so yeah. it was like I have a I have a huge huge stash of vintage buttons that I'll you know I bought as a knitter thinking that I would use them on garments okay. but I'll never use I mean I will never knit enough garments to use them all but it's mm -hmm. fun to go in there and and I should use them more I actually have Another I've, a couple of pieces that I've used. I found ways to use these buttons. Um, this is just one of them. Yeah, you, you've used them perfectly here. I can't imagine any other closure but these. No, oh, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, pipeline back and forth. So pipeline is another of what I call my limited edition um, pieces. Um, came about because I live away from my Philadelphia studio in the summer and I can't create the same way I do when I'm here. I mean, you kind of get a sense of I'm surrounded by stuff and I need that stuff to pull to create. So um, I decided to see if I could create a piece that I could then replicate much like the slider bracelets, but in necklace form um, that I could use for some shows I had coming up in the fall. And this was the result. So mm -hmm. this is uh, a similar technique to the slider bracelet. The, um, the innovation in this um, design is that because it's so much bigger and so much fuller that um, when I did the graft, the piece would collapse on itself. It wouldn't maintain its circular form. So I had to find a way to fill it to keep that shape. And at first I thought I would stuff it with batting because that was my go-to, but that was going to be a real pain to get it all the way inside and how I was going to do it. And then I realized um, I had available to me um, a sewer's um, material called welting, which is um, what they use to make the, the piping around pillows. So it's just kind of a big cotton thread that um, comes in various widths and I could close this around the welting still do the same kind of zipper graft so that it's seamless but it's soft but it's firm mm -hmm. so it just makes the necklaces hold their shape so that was a wonderful discovery and I've now discovered you know the different widths of it so that I can use it in smaller pieces so so this line comes in a big a wide width like this but then I've also made a second version that's narrower for people who aren't comfortable wearing such a big piece of, at the neck so um 
uh, yeah, but these are all, this is because there's 20 rows of knitting and hundreds of beads. There's like 1200 beads um, mm -hmm. in a piece like this. And they're all strung in advance. And as I would say to my students, they're all counted at least three times mm -hmm. each row before you finish because it, one bead out of whack and the whole mm -hmm. design gets shot to you know where. Right. So um, they're all graft first and then strung and then knitted. So it's, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah, just beautiful. Uh, the clasp, is that magnetic? Um, it is magnetic and they are acrylic. So um, they're good for, uh, I think, people who have, who don't want to wear metal next to their skin. Mm -hmm. um, and oops, it's falling off. This guy doesn't want to be on me today. Um, <laughs> let her go. Um, <laughs> knocked it. Um, uh, and they, they come in, in different uh, colors. They come in colors and they come in different metallics. They come in shiny. They come in matte. They're, they're great. The big honk okay. I love them. Yeah, they're just the right finish. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, pipeline Fibonacci. So um, we included this one be just because um, it's kind of a fun fact. Um, this one, I didn't have the beads go all the way around without a place, as you like to say, to breathe. Created spaces in between the beaded sections where the fiber is wrapped much like it is right next to the closure. But the bead pattern in each of those sections is um, a Fibonacci sequence, meaning Fibonacci sequence is um, numbered sequences where each uh, subsequent number is the sum of the two numbers before. Mm -hmm. So one, two, one plus two equals three, two plus three equals five, three plus five equals eight. So that would be a Fibonacci sequence. And so each of these beaded sequence, the sequence the, the black is the one, then there's two, and then it's a little harder to see, but the, the gold ones, one is matte and one is um, shiny. So it's one, two, three, five in each of the sequences. It was just a way for me to keep my brain interested. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. How did you come to think of the, the Fibonacci concept in the first place? Um, it's used not infrequently in knitting. Um, people use it for design work. Okay. Yeah. So it's something that I was aware of um, okay. from knitting, from knitting purposes, but I've never used it in my own work until now. Okay. And second impressions is the last piece we're going to look at now. Um, yeah. Tell us about this magnificent piece. So um, this piece, I would give uh, real credit to, um, again, to Bruce Hoffman, my gallery director, who um, is always kind of pushing me you know, to explore different things. And um, I think you can get a sense. And again, I'm kind of happy to own it that a lot of my work is what I would say is kind of buttoned up. You know, I mean, it's it it has a shape and a form and it stays where it's put. Um, and he was always encouraging me, his work, his personal art is just wild. I mean, it's just all over the place. It's really fabulous. Um, and so he's been encouraging me to be a bit looser in the way I work. And so um, this is the first result of that encouragement. Um, I literally just uh, took um, these fibers that I have. This is what's called a rayon chainette, tubular fiber. I call it knitting needle pantyhose because it's already a circle and you can stick a knitting needle inside it like you're putting pantyhose on it. Um, but what that allows is you can thread it and squinch it up so that it creates the um, the fiber strands that you see there. And all of these uh, rayon uh, uh, fibers that I had were all variegated. So I pulled out the ones that I felt worked together as a starting place for the colorway. And then I could um, use and look for uh, other pieces that I might have. And I had purchased these dyed impression jasper plaques over the summer. And that's actually why I chose the colorways of the strands was to go with the Jasper. And then from there, I pulled other colored beads and then I knit um, beads with silks and just made this whole big jumble of beads and uh, knitted beads and found beads and fiber on my tray and then tried to figure out a way to put them together. And um, this was the result. And I, I have to give a shout out to my professional photographer, Larry Berman, is the one who took this image um, and I just, I love it like crazy. The fact that he was able to show this piece and show how it, um, the, the variety of it and the various components that were in it without separating it out too much because when it hangs, it really does kind of just 
you know, hang there. Um, but this really shows all of the components that go to make up this piece. And I've really enjoyed making it. And I've made a subsequent piece that's even when, when Bruce saw this one, he goes, okay, now bigger. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. He okay. said, oh, I wanted it to cover your whole chest. And I go, okay, I can try that. So the okay. next one is closer. It's still not quite <laughs> to his, you know, I think he hasn't seen it yet, but I think he'll say, no, you can still go bigger. So maybe I'll try. We'll see. Okay. It's, it it's somewhere between permission and, and encouragement. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but Bruce is the director of the Gravers Lane Gallery, as we mentioned yeah. earlier, right? And yes. I think it's wonderful that you have this dialogue, this ongoing dialogue with him, and, oh. and that you're open to his suggestions, and he's open, he must be open to yours too. Oh, without question. I mean, this is a man who has been involved in the fiber world for decades. I mean, he knows every artist, every technique, every everything. I mean, he's so knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, why would you not listen to him? You know, it doesn't mean, well, I, so this is something my mother this is another thing from my mother that I want to, I just want to give a shout out to. My mother always said to me, and I hope this was true of my own children, that I just want them to ask me for my opinion. My mother said, just ask me for my opinion. Doesn't mean you have to follow it, but mm. put it into the mix, you know, just allow me to weigh in on what it is you're thinking and how I might bring some of my experience, my life knowledge into the choices that you make. And that's what I feel like this with Bruce. He doesn't expect me to do what he suggests. He's offering me knowledge and ideas that I'd be foolish not to listen to. Why would I not? And if I try it, it doesn't work. So I'll go and do something else. But, you know, I look for inspiration in so many places. Why wouldn't I take it from someone who has that level of experience and knowledge? I mean, it'd be silly not to. Well, but you, you, there, I, I, I think there are people <clears throat> excuse me, in the world and all walks of life who might, whose ego, so to speak, um, might get in the way of them welcoming input, you know, from anyone else but themselves, you know. And so I, I, I salute you for being humble enough and open-minded enough and, and generous of spirit enough to, to listen to what he's suggesting and to, to, to act on it, you know. I was brought up. It's, it's, I don't know any other way. Well, that was a great gift your mom gave you. Oh, Huge, absolutely. you know, Huge. try it and among see what things. happens. Yeah. Among many, yeah. among many. And she's still alive, right? What does she think of your accomplishments here? Oh, she's my biggest fan. She's my biggest fan. She just turned 98 last month. And awesome. she, yeah, no, she's my biggest fan. Always has been. Fantastic. Anyway, to get back to our last piece, Second Impressions, I want to mention that you know, this is an ancient necklace structure, this multiple strand structure with irregularly asymmetrically placed elements, you know, um, probably this general structure has been done for thousands of years, I'm guessing, um, but you've done it in such a new way and in such a distinctive, in a in, a, in your own way. Um, and so it's it seems to be heading in a whole new direction, but I'm not sure where, but I love it. Thank you. Well, it's, um, I... It's been such a gift to have you respond to to my work because you see it with new eyes. You know, you you get used to looking at your own work in certain ways, and to have someone with your um, background, you know, respond to it is really informative and affirming, and all the all the things you would like it to be. So I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed our dialogue. Um, I want to mention before we you know close up here that um, as we were putting together this slideshow, you were the one to realize that I wanted to include the bead forward pieces, the pieces that look like what a bead worker would make. And you wanted to integrate some of the pieces that were more knitting forward. A am I saying that correctly? Absolutely. Okay. And we eventually decided we would each choose half of the pieces. Mine would be bead forward. Yours would be most likely mostly knitting forward or technique uh, forward, technique oriented. And in the end, we we came up with, I think, a, a, the perfect combination of both, right? I totally agree. Okay. It's, well, it's been, you're, we, you're we've been saying all along as we do this, it takes a village. And it takes been... a village and your work is amazing. So it's easy to do. Okay. So uh, we want to now uh, mention that in our next uh, meeting or interview, we're going to talk about your book, among other things. Um, 
are we going to focus on technique or looking at different pieces or what are we going to do? Um, we're still deciding, but I know you have ideas. I do. I, I mean, there, there are several ideas, but one of the most important to me and the reason that I wrote the book is to deal with the issue of creativity and specific, more specifically creativity for left brained people mm -hmm. like me. And um, also the book, my um, intent in the book is also to try to demystify the artistic process. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a formally trained artist. I've never been to art school. Mm -hmm. You know, I've taken limited numbers of classes in what I do. I'm mostly self-taught, but again, because I was encouraged to try things. So it seemed logical to teach myself. I've taken classes when I've needed to, but um, I just think that uh, people get intimidated by the word art and as I was for many, many years, I'm not anymore. Um, and so the book help explain, helps to explain how I got from where I was to where I am. And I think given my discussions with knitters with whom I've interacted over around the book, I think it's really helped people um, begin to feel differently about their own creative journeys and their own creative potential. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and the techniques and the, and the projects in the book just really go to help explicate that process and um, and to help demystify um, what being truly creative means okay. and how you can do it. All right. Um, and so this this beautiful series, this necklace of beaded beads and the beaded earrings, these are this is one of the projects uh, in your book, right? Yeah. That shows you how to make something I'd love to learn to make, which is a bead knitted bead. Um, yeah, these, uh, and this piece, again, was inspired by an independent dyer who had a series of yarns that she created called Four Seasons. So each of the, each of the variegated beads, each of, excuse me, each of the variegated yarns in the four oval beads represents a season. So mm -hmm. upper right corner is winter, then moving around counterclockwise is spring, excuse me, uh, winter, then spring, then summer, and then fall. So I just jumped off from her yarns to create the beads to put together to create the Four Seasons necklace. But yeah, no, there's, and we'll talk, we can also talk in the next interview. I have a, um, I have a craftsy class that teaches you how to make these. Oh, really? I do. We're going to have do. to link to that somewhere. Yep. And I'm going to have to take it because I would love to know how to do this. It's, it, it really is, you're going to probably have to learn how to do some basic knitting first. Okay, I think I can, okay. I'm sure you can. I have no question that you can. Okay, um, okay. But the basic knitting comes first and then the beads get added. Okay, all right. You make it look so easy. It's It really is not that hard. It just takes a little practice like anything else. I've said to my, again, I said to my students, the first time you tried basic knitting, did you get it right away? You know, when mm -hmm. they're struggling over bead knitting. And of course they didn't, it takes some practice. And I said the same thing with bead knitting. You, now you've got two sticks of string and now you've got beads added into it. So give yourself a little grace, you know, give yourself a little time and okay. it'll come the same way you learn to knit, the same way you've learned to do what you do. Okay. You don't get it. All right. Okay. Um, but you don't, you don't just make uh, pieces to wear. Sometimes you make pieces that are non-wearable. And so we did add in this slide of the Pence jug. Can you, can you tell us about this? So this came about in a kind of funny way. Um, uh, there's a wonderful, another one, there's so many wonderful creative people in the knitting world that I just mm -hmm. so admire. And Franklin Habit is one of them. He was, uh, used to be a Chicago resident near you. He's a, a knitter, a sewer, a photographer, a comic artist, a writer. Um, he has since moved to Paris. He's now an expat. Um, but I saw him give a, um, a lecture about um, his desire to translate Victorian knitting patterns into current terminology. Apparently the nomenclature used in the Victorian era is very different than we use today. So he would translate these patterns. And one of the little pieces that he translated was what you see on the left, the colored, what's called a little pence jug. And that's about four inches high. And mm -hmm. when I saw this, I said, look at those stitches. I mean, that's got to be beaded. So I asked him if I could take a stab at it. And he said, go for it. And um, this, is, this was the result. I actually have it here with me. It's two inches high. Wow. wow. Um, fabulous. 
Yeah, it's and it's so it's a real it's a real example of sculptural knitting and the kind of techniques you have to use in order to make this stand and be firm and whatever. So um yeah, so that was fun. And we'll put a link in. He did a whole story about it um that we'll link to in the show notes. And mm -hmm. but I've also we'll and we'll talk about in addition to making jewelry, because I didn't always just make jewelry, I just designed garments and accessories and other kinds of wearables. So um and bead knitting comes to play in all of those. Okay, great. So people can find you uh, on your website, um, yes. which is the name of your website is Studio B Knits. Studio B Knits. B for Betsy. Yeah. Studio B Knits. Okay. Com. okay. And you've got your work there. And I'm sure you, you probably have a link to your book there, maybe. Um, yes. I, well, yes. I have to go back and look. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's that's right. We'll, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes anyway. Your book. Yeah, right. Okay, um, and then, you know, lastly, we do want to thank the the people who took the beautiful photos uh, in our presentation here. And can you name them? I can. I can happily name them. So Alexis Zanakis, um, he's the X in XRX books, um, is the person who did the uh, the photos that we've lifted from my book. Um, I call him the illuminator and I've never had my work shown more creatively than he does in this book. He's just extraordinary. Um, Larry Berman is my current professional photographer who photographs my work for show submissions and whatever else I need to get it out there for. Um, I am a very amateur photographer, um, but I've started out taking my own images uh, in my early days because I couldn't afford to have a professional photographer. It's very expensive. Um, but even now I'll take what I call placeholder um, pictures um, before I send it off just in case things were to get lost in the, in the mailing. And um, Ann Morris is a neighbor of mine where I live now who's a professional photographer. And she took the uh, that lovely picture of me um, that, will, that, that shows in that uh, previous slide. Okay, thank you. It's been thank so much fun. <laughs> it's been, I thank, we thank them too. And I yeah. thank you. It's been so much fun working together with you on this uh, presentation and just getting to know you a little better and getting That's to so chat cool. with you about your, your many masterpieces. And we're not even showing all of them. We're probably not even showing half of them here. So well done. Congratulations on your work and your innovations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know how I've admired your work for a very long time. And so to be able to do this with you is a is a gift I'd never imagined. So I'm very grateful and I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you. It's a gift for me, too. And I will see you in our second meeting. Terrific. Thank you, Valerie. You're welcome. Very welcome, Betsy. Thank you, too.